Good day, Deep and Word family. Welcome to day 196 of our Bible study review. Today, we're going through chapters 9 through 11 of the book of Zechariah. Chapter 9 opens up with an oracle or a message against Israel's enemies. Let's just open up and start reading. It says, an oracle of the word of Yahuwah that is against the land of Hadrach and Damascus is the place where it will rest. For the eyes of men and the tribes of Israel are on Yahuwah. Also Hamath borders it, even Tyre and Sidon, cities that are very wise. Tyre has built up a rampart for herself and stored up silver like it were dust and even gold like it were mud in the streets. The Adon will dispossess her of her possessions and strike down her power in the sea and she shall be devoured with fire. Ashkelon will observe this in fear. Gaza as well will writhe in anguish. Even Ekron, her hope will be confounded. The king of Gaza will perish and no one will inhabit Ashkelon. A mongrel people will dwell in Ashdod and I will cut down the pride of Philistia. I will take away the bloodshed from its mouth and the abominations from between its teeth. Even it will be a remnant for Elohim. It will be like the tribe of the clan of Judah and Ekron like the Jebusites. In verses 1 through 7, these are the judgments of Yahuwah that are actually performed by Alexander the Great. All of those territories from verses 1 through 7 conquered by him. The last portion of this is heavily focused on the Philistine territories. Specifically, it talks about Akron, how Ekron will become a remnant for Elohim, like the Jebusites were to the Judeans. Now, this goes back to the time when King David conquered the city of Jerusalem, who resided there before King David. It was the Jebusites. Now, he did not make an end of them. They were a remnant, right? They were assimilated into Judah. You can read this in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. And 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 16. Let's pick up in verse 8. It says, Then I will make camp at my house with a garrison. And this is Yahuwah speaking through Zechariah, talking about he will camp, set down in his house in Jerusalem. And he says, So that no one can pass back and forth, and no oppressor will pass through them. For now I see with my eyes. Josephus records in the book of Antiquities how the high priest welcomed Alexander the Great, and Alexander the Great came in and met with the high priest during the time, and they showed Alexander the Great the book of Daniel. And it was understood by Alexander the Great that he was prophesied about as this strong kingdom of bronze, as it was pictured in the image of Daniel 2. And Alexander the Great was actually kind to the Jewish people, and he was recorded as being a friend. But after his demise, those four generals who rose up after him would be a completely different story. Feel free to check out the resources down in the description box below to read about this account with the Judeans and Alexander the Great. Let's pick up in verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, and cry aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and able to deliver. He is humble and riding on a donkey, a cult, the offspring of a donkey. That is the prophecy concerning our Messiah. He did come in for the feast of Passover. As it was commanded in the first month of Abib, right? You were to bring a lamb without blemish, a perfect one on the 10th day of the month. And then four days later, that lamb was to be offered up. Verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the bow for battle will be cut off. This is speaking during the time of the millennial reign. We will learn war no more. All the weapons have to go down, right? The swords will be beaten into plowshares. All of those swords and weapons from the battle of Armageddon, they will be turned into farming instruments. Let's keep reading. It says he will speak peace to the nations and his dominion will be from one sea to another and from one great river to the ends of the earth. And as for you, because of the blood of your covenant, I will send your prisoners from the empty waterless pit. 
this points to those water cisterns that were in the ground. I don't know if you remember, one of the prophets were placed in a cistern as a form of punishment because he was prophesying the true word of Yahuwah. So he's saying he's going to rescue those who are prisoners who are stuck in those waterless cisterns. Verse 12, return to your stronghold prisoners who now have hope. Today, I declare that I will return to you a double portion. He is speaking to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he says, because I have bent Judah as my bow and fitted the bow with Ephraim. So he's calling himself the archer. Judah is the bow, right? And Ephraim is the arrow. And he is going to Return back to them everything. And he says, return back to your strongholds, right? Return back to your kingdom. You have nothing to fear. I'm actually going to use you as a weapon to conquer those who are coming to conquer you. We're about to read that in the next portion. And it says, I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and I will set you like the sword of a warrior. Now you can read about this in the Maccabean revolt when Antiochus Epiphanes, right, which is one of those four generals who rose up after Alexander the Great, who was kind to them, but Antiochus Epiphanes was not. He wreaked havoc over the Judean people. He tortured them. He made many of them convert to Hellenistic ways, right? And then he also set up an image of Zeus with his head on it, and he was making them bow down and worship, and he slaughtered many of them. Antiochus Epiphanes is a type and shadow of the Antichrist in the very end. Verse 14, then Yahuwah will appear over them, and his arrow will go out like lightning. Yahuwah Elohim will sound his trumpet, and will march forth like the storm winds of southern Timon. I think that's an obvious reference to the Feast of Trumpets that will happen in the near future. All right, let's keep reading verse 15. It says, Yahuwah of hosts will protect them. They will devour up and subdue them with stone slingers, and they will drink and make noise with wine. They will be filled with blood as a bowl, saturated like the corners of the altar. Yahuwah, their Elohim, will deliver them in that day like the flock of his people. For the jewels embedded in a crown, they will shine in his hand. Again, I believe that is talking about the Feast of Trumpets, right? Yom Teruah, when he does deliver his people. And it says right here, verse 17, for how great is his goodness and how great his beauty. There will be grain for the young men and new wine to prosper the young women. So he's talking about the millennial reign. When we enter into that time, all of the grain, all of the wine, right? All of the vineyards, everything is going to blossom forth because there will be blessing in the land. And he makes that evident as we walk into chapter 10. Listen to what he has to say. He tells his people, ask for rain from Yahuwah during the season of the latter spring rains. And Yahuwah will make the storm winds and he will give them showers of rain. All will have vegetation in the field, right? We know Jerusalem is not the place like Egypt. It's not a place like anywhere else where you can rely on the Nile, where you can rely on other things, right? They had to pray for rain. They had to be completely dependent on Yahuwah for their sustenance. And he's saying, be bold, come before me boldly and ask for the latter rains. Rain in due season is a blessing from up above. It is directly a blessing from the Father. As we know in the very end of the book of Zechariah, if you've never read it before, one of the curses for those who do not come up during the millennial reign at the Feast of Tabernacles, it says that our Messiah will know exactly who did not come up and the plague for them will be that he will send no rain in that region and they will starve until they come up and hear the law. But he's saying for his people during that time, all you have to do is inquire of me. All you have to do is ask and I shall send the rain. Verse 2. For the household of idols speak wickedness, and the diviners envision lies. They utter false dreams and provide comfort that does not last. So the people wander about like sheep. They are afflicted because there is 
no shepherd. So we see that it quickly switches from a time of abundance by being obedient. And then he says his people have gone astray because of the shepherds. The shepherds have led them into idol worship. And he says, my anger burns against the shepherds and I will visit judgment on the leaders. Now your Bible may say male goats, but that's a characteristic of a goat. A goat is not like a sheep. A sheep listens to the voice of the shepherd, but goats are stubborn and they do their own will. And he's calling these shepherds that lead the sheep astray as male goats. And if you did not know, right, the goat is synonymous with those who worship Satan, those who are not following the voice of the great shepherd. They are following the voice of the greatest goat, and that is Satan. And no, I'm not talking about greatest of all time. I'm talking about a rebellious, stubborn being that does not do the will of Yah. Let's keep reading. It says, For Yahuwah of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his majestic horse in battle. From him comes the cornerstone, and from him the tent peg. Now we know our Messiah is called the cornerstone, the great cornerstone, and he is the tent peg. Remember, when the children of Israel, they were dwelling in tents, right? They had to take a tent peg and secure their tents. Well, we are called tabernacles, right? This is a temporary tabernacle. And the one who is holding us down right now is our Messiah. He's the tent peg. Let's keep reading. It says, from him comes the bow for battle. And from him, every ruler goes out all these together. So our Messiah alone is going to conquer all of these rebellious nations and all of these wicked rulers that are wreaking havoc over the earth right now. When they come up for battle, right? The battle of Armageddon, it's not going to be a battle. He is going to strike them with the sword of his word and they will all fall. Verse five, and now he picks up talking about his people again, his Judean people, right? Judah, he says, and they will be as mighty men who trample down in the muddy streets and battle. They will fight because Yahuwah is with them and he will put to shame those riding on horses. I will make strong the house of Judah and will deliver the house of Joseph. That is Ephraim. That is us. Okay. And it says, I will restore them because I have compassion on them. They will be like I have never rejected them, for I am Yahuwah, their Elohim, and I will respond to them. Then Ephraim shall be like the mighty man, and their hearts shall rejoice as with wine. Their children shall see this and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in Yahuwah. Verse 8, I will whistle to them and gather them in, for I have ransomed them. They will be numerous as they were numerous before. When I scatter them among the nations, they will remember me in the distant lands. They will live with their children and then return. I will bring them home from the land of Egypt. I will gather them from Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until there is no room for them. Remember, this is fulfilling prophecy. Abraham will be a father of many nations, right? All of the earth is blessed through his capital S seed. We are the heirs according to the promise. We are the children of Abraham. Zion will have to stretch her borders to fit all of the righteous ones who come in through Messiah. Verse 11, he will pass through the sea of distress and will put down the waves of the sea. All of the depths of the Nile will be dried up and the arrogance of Assyria will be brought down and the scepter of Egypt will turn away. I will make them strong and Yahuwah, and they will go to and fro in his name, says Yahuwah. Absolutely, that is true. During the millennial reign, we will go to and fro. We won't have any enemies to make us terrified. For one, we're going to have glorified bodies, and we will have positions during the millennial reign. We will be assisting our king and making sure that the whole earth is filled with his glory, with righteousness and justice. Chapter 11. Open your doors, O Lebanon, so the fire can come in and consume your cedar. Well, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen. The majestic trees are destroyed. Wail, O oaks of Bashan, because the unassailable forest has now been brought down. So all of these trees, right? Lebanon was known for their strong 
trees and all of these trees are representative of these nations who are strong but they will be brought down low and it says there is a sound of wailing shepherds because their glory is ruined there's a sound of roaring lions because the pride of jordan is ruined and now we walk into a portion that zechariah is actually going to act out and he's going to act out that there's two different types of shepherds there's a wicked one and then there's a good one so let's read about it it says thus says yahuwah my elohim shepherd the flock of slaughter the ones who buy them then slaughter them and have no guilt and those who sell them say blessed is yahuwah because i am rich their own shepherds do not take pity on them this is a wicked shepherd and so it says for i will no longer have pity on those who dwell in the land says yahuwah but i will cause each of them to fall into the hands of his neighbor even into the hands of his king and i believe this is pointing to the roman empire right and it says they will crush the land and i will not deliver any from their hands and so what is the major belief in judaism is that the messiah would come and immediately overthrow their oppressors but because they rejected their shepherd right he says i will not i will not take this from you i will let them come and oppress your land verse 7 so i shepherded the flock that was for slaughter even the afflicted of the flock and i took for myself two staffs one of them i called favor or your bible may say grace and the other i gave the name union so these are the names of two staffs and Zechariah is acting this out but it's also pointing to the future and it says so I pastured the flock I destroyed the three shepherds in the span of one month now many believe that the three shepherds that Zechariah is speaking of is king prophet and priest since Israel as a whole rejected their Messiah they would no longer have a king priest or prophet to minister unto them and we know that to be true after the roman siege what did they do to judah they dispersed judah again now not that the romans did it the first time babylon did it but you see that judah is dispersed again because they are rejecting the council the true council of yahuwah who is the great shepherd messiah yeshua or yehoshua all right and so it says for my soul was impatient with them and their souls detested me Oh my goodness. Then I said, I will not shepherd you. What is to die? Let it die. What is to be destroyed? Let it be destroyed. Let those who are left devour each other's flesh. And that is exactly what happened. Now, not literally, but we know that the second temple period, right? That was destroyed because of baseless hatred among their own people. Let's pick up in verse 10. It says, so I took the staff named favor or grace and cut it into pieces to break the covenant that i made with all of the peoples now still zachariah is acting this out in front of those whom he is testifying to but this can also point to our messiah all right that's how prophecy works and it says so it was broken that day and afflicted of the flock were watching me and knew that this was the word of yahuwah could this also be pointing to our messiah on the cross those who were afflicted, they saw him and they knew that he was the word of Yah. The afflicted ones, the ones who were following Messiah and they were being persecuted by their own brethren. They saw him on the cross. They were afflicted and they knew that he was the son of the living God. Verse 12, Zechariah is still acting this out. But again, it does point to our Messiah. He says, then I said to them, if this is good in your eyes, then give me my wages. But if not, then keep it. Then it says, they weighed my wages as 30 pieces of silver. Come on, y'all, because our Messiah was betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. Now, this is not a small amount, right? This is the cost for purchasing a slave. And so this is exactly what Judas did to his own brethren he sold and ratted out the messiah to the pharisees and sadducees so as zechariah is acting this out and it's still pointing to the future now zechariah has 30 pieces of silver and yahuwah tells him what to do with it in verse 13 he says then yahuwah said to me throw it to the potter the splendid price by which i was valued 
by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the house of Yahuwah to the potter. Then I cut up the second staff, Union, to break the brotherhood between Judah and and Israel. Then Yahuwah said to me, take for yourself again the vessels carried by foolish shepherds. I am raising up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are perishing, nor seek the young, nor heal the broken, nor feed those who are standing still. Now notice that the good shepherd does the opposite, right? The good shepherd heals them. The good shepherd cares about the young. He cares about the broken, those who are sick. He heals them. But he says, I will send to them a shepherd that does not do these things. And he says, but he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves to pieces. Now this may have a double reference because we know that our Messiah was brought before trial and Pilate asked the people, who shall I release to you? Right? And they had the choice to release the good shepherd or Barabbas, who was a murderer. And they asked for Barabbas. Now, this does not completely fulfill this part of a prophecy, but it does point to the greater fulfillment, how the people will ask for the Antichrist and not the true Christ. Verse 17, woe to this worthless shepherd who abandons his flock. May the sword take his arm and his right eye. May his arm surely wither up and his right eye become blind. Now, we know in the book of Revelation that the Antichrist will suffer a great wound, right? And he will have this miraculous performance of raising from the dead. He's going to mock what our Messiah has done. And you can read about that in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, and in the same chapter, but with verses 12 and 14. It is sad that the majority who are over there in the land of Israel reject their Messiah they are making preparations for this third temple, right? And they're excited. They don't know that they're being deceived. But when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's not going to immediately show up as this bad guy. He's going to make a false covenant of peace with them. And then he's going to show his true colors. And he's going to be 10 times worse than Antiochus Epiphanes Ever was. He is going to be fully embodied with the power and the wickedness of Satan, and he is going to do his best to completely destroy Judah. But many will repent and many will flee when they recognize that they've got the wrong guy. And it says right here in Matthew 24, verse 20 Pray that your escape will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then will be great tribulation, such as has not happened since the beginning of the world until now, nor will there ever be. It's going to be the most difficult time in history. Nothing has ever compared to what will be in the tribulation. And Messiah warned them even further at the sign of his coming. He says, if someone says, here's the Messiah or there's the Messiah, he says, do not look. He says, my coming will be obvious to all mankind. And he says, as lightning flashes from the east to the west, right? He says, every eye will see me coming. That's when you will know that I am here. Deep in word family, I encourage you to pray for those who have scales on their eyes because they truly desire to have their Messiah revealed unto them and they have been deceived by their own brethren. Pray Pray for those to see who their Messiah is, whether they are from the tribe of Judah or whether they are from the nations. Everyone needs him to survive. Every last breathing soul needs the salvation of Yah. They need Yehoshua. They need Yeshua. They need Jesus. He is the savior of the whole world, right? He came to save his own first, but his own would not receive him. And because there was a partial blindness, right? Not all Jews, because there are many who love him and they are doing a great work over there in the land of Israel. But the majority, right? They speak the most harsh things about Yeshua and they don't know that they're speaking about their saving grace. They don't know that they're speaking about their own Messiah. Pray in this season for them. Pray in this season for your loved ones. Pray for all mankind. As we can see that the signs are all 
around us. The time is ticking and the clock is running out. It is about 11.45. There is not much time left. So please pray. Intercede for those who do not see the way that you do. Know that our Father in heaven hears your prayers. You are praying his will because he does not will for any man to perish. And the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Deep and more family, that's all that I have for you today. Until tomorrow, Yah bless.